It is Monday, June 10th, 2019, and this is the MMA Hour, everybody. My name is Luke Thomas. I am the host of this program. Thank you so much for watching. I greatly appreciate it. Um, okay, what a show we have planned for you guys today. Championship royalty is going to be here. Bellator bantamweight champion Darian Caldwell is going to be here at about 1 o'clock in studio right here, sitting at this seat. In my judgment, probably the best fight this weekend, at least on paper, when he rematches Kyoji Horiguchi, your Ryzen champion. Uh, that is going to be at Bellator NYC. Very much looking forward to that contest. We will talk to him about that at 1 o'clock. At 1.30... Top contender, in my judgment, the guy who should probably be next for Henry Cejudo. I guess we'll see how, the, how that all shakes out. But for sure, your top-ranked bantamweight, Aljamain Sterling, will be here. The Funk Master after his big win over Pedro Munoz at UFC 238. Plus, speaking of UFC 238, as well as you guys, you're going to be my guest not one but two different ways. We're going to talk about all the big issues coming out of the weekend. First with a round of tweets using the hashtag the MMA Hour. Then with your calls on the sound off. Uh, of course, you can always call 844-866-2468. Uh, international callers, as always, can email a voice clip, the MMA Hour at voxmedia.com. Okay, hope everyone had a great weekend. Uh, I spent mine trying to physically repair my body, get sleep when my daughter was asleep, and then watch MMA. I didn't really do a whole lot else. That sounds pretty standard for me. I got my hipster coffee here. Let's see how it tastes. Ready? Again, these people don't know what they're doing, but it's edible. Um, all right, so a lot to get to, a lot to get to. UFC 238 was fantastic, I thought. Generally speaking, a couple of duds here, there, some controversies here or there, but generally speaking, pretty good. So let's start today's show the way we typically start this show, with our YouTube exclusive looking back on some of the action. It's time for the Monday Morning Analyst. I uh, hope everyone's doing quite well. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone who watched last week's Andy Ruiz breakdown. The video did pretty well, and people seem to like it, so I'm very appreciative that you guys took the time to, uh, to watch that. Um, I want to talk about Henry Cejudo today. But before I do, uh, I want to show you one thing, and we're going to get into Henry Cejudo. Normally, I would save this for the end, but if I save it for the end, we're not going to get to it. So I want to put it right at the front, just very, very quickly. Every technique breakdown that you see, typically on YouTube, they're all done a little bit differently. Shouts to everybody who does it. Some people have longer videos. Some people have shorter videos. Um, the Weasel is a great breakdown channel. He does a little bit of like play-by-play, -play, sort of goes through the fight. He's phenomenal. He's great. There's mixed... Um, oh, God, there's one person. I forget the exact name of their, their uh, YouTube account, but they do... It's like... What is his name? Um, it's, it's, it's a play on MMA, something martial artist. Um, he's quite good. Uh, Shane Faison does good for fight tips, although he does less breakdowns. Obviously, Dan Hardy's great as well. I, I try to do more like explication. That I think that that style is a little bit different than the other ones. But there's one thing I harp on that I just don't hear a lot of analysts talk about, and it is very surprising to me because to me it's a really fundamental concept, which is the half beat. If you watch the Monday Morning Analyst, you know how often I talk about the half beat, and if you're new to it. There's a standard rhythm that everybody typically operates at. You don't want to strike on the rhythm. You want to strike right at the half before the next one goes. You have to disrupt their timing. And the reason why is not just because they're, from a timing standpoint, not used to it. Their balance might not be set. Did you all see what Valentina Shevchenko did over the weekend? I thought she had murdered Jessica I, to be quite candid with you. But uh, mercifully, uh, Jessica lived. Go to the uh, slides here if you can here very quickly. I want to show you something. Daniel Cormier was absolutely right when he talked about um, Shevchenko going to the body, going to the body, going to the body, and then going to the head. That's all absolutely true. Can we go to the slides? Por favor. That, there we are. Um, there was one other thing she did. I want you to pay attention to the timing on this, and then we're going to change gears here very quickly to Henry Cejudo. Watch what happens here. Right? This is the one angle I picked. So you see her set her feet, right? She switches her hips. She's going to go from facing this way to kind of like, uh, let's see, watch. Right, so she's facing a little bit this way. She switches her hips, but look at this. She's timing this forward approach that Jessica had where she was kind of, she wasn't coming straight in. She, again, she was doing sort of a circular motion, less than cutting her off, more just backing her up. I want you to pay attention to something. She steps her foot in. That's when Shevchenko begins to throw. She sets and throws, and look at Jessica I's foot. 
it hasn't even hit the ground yet. By the time it does, boom. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not just that spatially she understood where she was and knew to through it. She was able to do that while catching her on the half. That is a level of skill I'd say maybe five UFC fighters have, to do it like that. To do it like that. That is extraordinary. You will see this very rarely if you watch MMA. No one is usually quite that good. Look at this. Jessica I was dead before her foot even, I hate to use these terms, she was beaten before she ever had a chance to set her balance. She was halfway to the home run before this foot can even hit the ground. Dunzo. Dunzo. And I also want to pay attention, Daniel Cormier was like, well, she thought it was, and, and, and he was right, that she was kind of hunched over. Jessica I, if you watch, she was kind of approaching like this, almost like a halfway wrestling stance. But I want you to pay attention to the location of the shot. It's right here. Even if you had a glove up by the ear, it still would have hit the crown of the head. I'm not sure uh, a halfway defense would have stopped that. But the real lesson here is, I have people write me all the time saying, no one ever talks about the half beat, no one ever talks about the half beat. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let it be known, gold ring embedded with stone. I talk about the half beat constantly because it's such a it is what separates very good strikers from the truly elite the ones who can time you those are the ones boom and just look at this timing one more time as jessica i steps in look at that it's over it's over and the kick hasn't even landed because she doesn't have any chance to defend herself she gets hit right on the half beat that is sniper sniper work all right put the uh, thumbnail back up please all right, with that out of the way, with that self-congratulations out of the way, let's do this. Let's talk about Henry Cejudo. Um, I went back and I rewatched the main event to sort of see how things happened. That is what today's lesson is primarily about. And what happened is a story of adaptability. It's a story of digging deep. It's a story of just somebody who's a born competitor who has managed to put the pieces of the puzzle, of, of his abilities anyway, together. Some people cannot maximize their own skills. He, in my judgment, is doing it. I mentioned this on my personal post-fight special that I did, but it's worth reiterating here with some additional details. It is not merely that Henry Cejudo was losing that fight against Marlon Moraes in the main event at UFC 238 and came back, although that's part of the story. It's not merely that he kind of plateaued with those two losses in a row um, against Johnson and Benavidez and then figured out and hit a new gear. It is also, if you look at his career, two things are kind of clear. He had to dig deep in the Olympics against, um, God, what is the Japanese guy's name in the, in the finals? Also in the semifinals, and I believe in the quarters as well, he was behind every single match in the Olympics. A lot of folks don't know this. When he won the gold medal, he ended up having to come from behind constantly to win. Constantly. And he did. He has an ability to dig deep in ways that are hard to express. And what does that mean? It means that when most people are prepared to quit, including other elite athletes, he simply will not let himself. He simply finds another gear. It sounds so obvious. Oh, I'm just not going to be deterred. Your body will tell you to be deterred. Your mind will play tricks on you. It's why, they, the, the, it's why the phrase exists. Fatigue makes cowards of men. Add in punishment on top of it, and most of us become cowards pretty quickly. Not Henry Cejudo. For him to show these hallmarks, of just a willingness to never give up, to always push back, it is truly, truly remarkable. And there is one more detail about this. Henry Cejudo came out of the Olympics as the uh, USA Wrestling's golden child. I think he was the only one at that Olympics, including Rovat, Marcos, excuse me, um, it, was, it was Mako, Rovat, DC, Askren, himself, who am I forgetting? Somebody else um, in the category, I think, above, above him, but before... I forget who, who the rest of that team was. He was the only one that medaled for the freestyle team. He was the only one that medaled. He was, the, he was the saving grace for the Beijing Games. And then he came out of it, and I remember distinctly when he tried to make the 2012 Games, and he failed. What were some reasons for that? Well, one, I want to focus in on this headline here. This is from Bloody Elbow. This is from a guy who used to write for Bloody Elbow by the name of Mike Reardon. Mike Reardon wrestled at the uh, wrestled Division I at the Citadel 
In my judgment, he is the best writer in MMA ever who covered and understood amateur wrestling. He was the best, and he gave it up to pursue a different career. He wrote this in 2013 or 2014. I can't remember exactly when, but it was reasons to worry about Henry Cejudo's future as a fighter. Why? Because coming out of the 2012 um, uh, national team trials, he didn't even make the team, much less go on to win. By the way, before the Olympics, he had placed 31st at the World Championships. Highly disappointing. And again, comes back. This guy is the comeback king. It's amazing what he's been able to do. But the point is this. So he fails to make a national team. Looks like his wrestling career is over. He actually retired, I believe, at that meet. And there were some concerning signs. He was with Terry Brands, a legend in the wrestling community. And, he, and Brands apparently was unimpressed with his work ethic. He was not training Henry Cejudo at the Olympic Training Center. He had his own private team, some of which are still in place. But a lot of them are now gone. But the ones who are gone back then were seen as a very deleterious influence on him. So people in the wrestling community were like, he's not really putting in the effort. He's got all the skill in the world, but he's got the wrong people around him for the most part. Not in totality, but a lot of the wrong ones. He's not in the right place. Whatever magic was, ended. This was written in 2012. If you go and read the whole thing, it's actually, I don't mean to blow up my career and, oh, he was so wrong. He was right. His concerns were well-founded. The difference is Henry figured it all out. Henry kept the right people around him. Eric Albaracin, I think, is one of the key ingredients. And got with some of the other right trainers, put himself in the right mind space, and the results speak for themselves. I encourage you to go back and find this from Bloody Elbow. It's a shame Mike doesn't write in MMA anymore. He was so good, by the way. UFC commentators were writing him to learn the difference between single legs and crackdowns and high crotches and everything else. Mike Reardon was a true talent in the sport, but he moved on. Anyway... I remember reading this and talking to him, and he was like, dude, the guy's got all the ability in the world. I just don't know if it's all going to materialize. So I think, for me, I've been a skeptic of Henry Cejudo. It all materialized for me on Saturday night. Now, with that out of the way, here is how he did it. It's actually fairly simple in the end. Um, this is how he adapted and overcame. Anyone who's in the Marine Corps, they know this phase very well. Some kind of challenge uh, greets you in the world, and what is your response? Your response is to adapt and overcome. That is exactly what Mr. Henry Cejudo did on Saturday night because Marlon Moraes had something for him in that first round, did he not? He certainly did. So what did he do? If you go back and you watch, it took Henry about nine minutes to figure this out. We're going to look at some of the slides here, but the reality is early on he was giving uh, Marlon so much space. And when you have so much space, what's the challenge? The challenge is that now you have to close that distance to make physical contact. The other component is the further you are away, typically, the easier it is to read and anticipate. So it's not just that getting into that space can be perilous because you can be timed, but it's easy to read a shot coming your way and then counter. It's easy to circle out. It just creates a ton of problems. Your defense is weaker. Your offense is weaker. It creates, it just, unless you're really good at that distance too, which it turns out Marlin was much better in that space. What he ended up doing was he just, took the space away. It's not as just as simple as that, but that's a key component of it. And the way he was able to do that was what I call, he found the frictionless right hand. What do I mean by frictionless right hand? Okay, what he ended up realizing was, if I'm going to be at space with this guy, his defense is really good, his footwork is really good, his balance is really good, and he can just do better things by his own abilities. But if I find a way to get close to him, I can disrupt his balance, I can take away his footwork, I can eventually, we'll talk about this in a second, find the clinch, and on top of that, I can make the things where his defense comes to life go away. Marlon Marais stood in the orthodox stance. He switched a little bit, but he had the orthodox stance, so his hand was kind of low. Henry Cejudo realized, if I throw the right in close proximity, it's going to land. And the reason for that is, or I should say the right from uh, his right hand, so it, that could have been this case, or it could have been this case, depending on his stance. But I called it frictionless because what he realized was when he tried to throw a punch from, let's say, his cross side too far away, Moraish had good head movement and blocked. When he threw it much closer, the head movement goes away. There's no trunk movement. The only thing that happens is, one, Moraish takes the punch, boom, or he blocked it which allows him to throw another and another and another. So what do I mean by frictionless? Finding the easiest, shortest path to make contact. That could be from a southpaw stance, and you're throwing a hooking punch because he doesn't see it coming. 
He actually likes the linear punches that he can slip. The ones that came around with a hook, he had a hard time seeing. Or as a jab, maybe you block it and then you fire, fire it up with something else. Or you fire it from um, orthodox stance and he's moving one direction and you crash into him as he walks into your punch. The point being is Marlon Marais has good defense far away. He's got good balance far away. He's got good footwork far away. When you crowd him, the footwork doesn't do much. He becomes unbalanced in throwing responses, and his head movement goes away. He has to see it from long range to slip. Kelvin Gastelum can slip in short range. Marlon Marais in this fight had a problem slipping, so he just ate the punch over and over and over and over. Frictionless. Catch him moving into it. Got him. Catch him with a jab, even if he blocks so you can follow up with a hook. Got him. Um, all different ways. Find the shortest, easiest way to deliver the right hand as you can, and you'll watch every piece of Moraisha's game go away. Pretty amazing. This is really what it all comes down to. It's not just that he landed this hand. It's that when he did it in that short order, all the things that make Marais so gifted as a striker, they all get diminished significantly. So then you follow up with some of the easier stuff. Don't let Marais set distance or feet. This leads into this, but when you watch early on, you'll look at how much space Cejudo is giving him. That's just, that, I mean, that's just, you, you, can't, you can't beat the guy that way. Not, not, not really. You got to get up in his grill. By the way, I didn't list it here. Part of it is Cejudo has an incredible chin. We don't talk about that, but it's really true. He has an unbelievable chin because... A lot of people don't want to trade with Marlon on the inside because he is going to connect, and when he does, he hits hard. This guy just ate a couple of those to deliver all of them back, and I think that was a big deterrence as well. Um, three, enter the clinch. I went back and looked at some of the numbers. If you look at the first four fights, we'll show this, of Cejudo's MMA, excuse me, UFC career, he, had, he did a lot of work in the clinch. And what happened in the fifth fight? He fought Demetrius Johnson, where he lost in the clinch. That's when he opened up and had that karate style against Wilson Hayes and other ones as well. He looks phenomenal. He went back to the old Henry here. He is totally comfortable in the clinch now, both as a controlling mechanism, as a takedown mechanism, as you saw in the second Demetrius Johnson fight, and now to deliver punishment. And again, in close quarters, what happened to Marlon Moraes? He just kind of covered up. The feet stopped moving. He didn't launch offense back. That was very effective. He certainly wasn't trying to duck and dodge in the clinch. Obviously, that's less of an issue, but he just kind of stood there. Um, if you can get up in his grill, at least if Henry can get up in his grill, he can do good things and then be first. Now, being first when you're far on the outside, not so helpful. Being first when you're on the inside was a major point. It, what he was able to do was either land and then draw reaction and dodge and then follow up or just land and land and land again. It was just, it, it was when, when Marlon is getting pressed into in this fight and backing up and kind of covering up and then winging a punch. You heard Mark Henry talk about like throwing straighter punches. For sure that would have helped, but I just think existentially that's, that's just not a way for Marlon to succeed is when someone's doing the kinds of things where he was doing. Straighter punches probably would have helped, no doubt about it. But, but for me, um, when, when someone is just kind of after him like that, you'll see his balance get totally disrupted. He, can't, he, can't, he just can't deliver the same kind of mechanisms uh, for offense as before. So... Those are the ones, but really it's the frictionless right hand, right? Take a, make, make this as easy to land in short distance with as little resistance as possible. Just stay on it with this one. Not long range, short range. Short distance, uh, timed all, you know, just frequent. Okay, real quickly, if I may. Look at some of these numbers here. I want to show you this one. Uh, clinch, right? Cejudo's on top, I believe. In the, in the clinch here, look at this, 11 of 41. Here, let me. 11 of four, uh, 14, excuse me, uh, 8 of 9 from the clinch. None in the first round, which was the one he lost, right? Pretty simple there. Uh, striking totals, you can just look at here, the numbers he was putting out and how it all went awry. Uh, not a whole lot to look at there. This one I found a little bit more interesting is this part. This is Cejudo here on the left. These are the landed by position. And you can see 21% in the clinch, so a fifth of all strikes landing there. By the way, look at this. Is this not the story of the fight? Whoop, whoop, whoop. Kind of amazing, right? Uh, but here, this was the one right there. It, that sort of tells you that that number, 21% in the clinch, that's the highest it's been since he had the Formiga fight. 
right? So he was that old style, but back then it was more like a control, maybe takedown scenario. Here it was just all offense. He tried one takedown or two perhaps, but they didn't really work. Um, okay, let's get to these. I want you to take a look at this. This is the opening part of the first round. Look at the amount of distance Henry Cejudo is giving this guy. He must go back and watch his tape and be like, what was I thinking? This is crazy amount of distance, right? Look at this. And I just want you to pay attention to this as we go through it. Look at how much distance is between them. And you can say, well, he's just evading there. Right, but it never really changes a whole lot. He's just kind of bouncing on the outside. And you see Marlon loves these charges where he comes in, fakes low, and comes with a left hook. He comes in, fakes with, fakes with his hands, and then comes up high with the head kick. Another key to this one was I didn't put it on the list because, you know, we're trying to condense it. He was really good about anticipating the head kick attacks from Marlon and getting out of the way or ducking under all of them. Really good job by, by Henry Cejudo there. Again, look at the amount of space. It's just crazy. It's crazy. You can't beat Marlon on the outside like this, right? So it just goes and goes, and you can see just, again, all, I mean, just look at all this daylight between them, right? Crazy. So Marlon's going to win this game every time. This is, this is his world, he's, and he's, by the way, he's taking center as well, yeah? Okay. So we're pushing through here. Just look at this. I want to pay attention again. He does that running inside kick all the time, and when you switch stances, he throws it on you too, and again, look at all the space he's giving him. You get the idea. Okay, let's move along here. All right. And he does this one again. Look at these charges he comes in. Kind of fakes low, lowers the level, wants to bring the hands down. Boom. Henry kind of read it, but still. Later in the first minute of the first round, eats that kick. Look at the six-punch combo because he's so far away. He's literally at the end of Marlon's punches. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, Henry blocked a lot of that, but that's a deterrent pretty, pretty badly. Here we go a little bit later. Throws the kick, eats a punch, slips it because he can anticipate it. Look, when he can put you at range, he can do this. Pop, pop. That's when his defense is pretty good. Again, look at how far away they are. Crazy, right? Here he is. He does that running bit again, pushes away, and gets up under it. He has nice defense up here. You can see him holding the hand. When he can get his balance forward like this, and he gets his feet under him, he can do good circling all the time. Look at the distance. Look at how far apart they are. They're not even in kicking range here. He has to step in. He throws it, right? Follows him. Let's see what happens. Comes in again, throws a high kick, backing him up the whole time. And again, just... <laughs> you can't win that way, man. You get the idea. Here he is. Southpaw, I think he changes stances. Boom, he throws this one. No, wait, he was before Orthodox? Yeah. So look, he's Orthodox. You can't quite see it because he's switching. He switches to South there. I, t I didn't edit this right. And then he kicks him to sort of like, as soon as he's changing stances to disrupt his timing and, and his offense, right? And he does it again. All right. So you just first round, he's just getting torn up. This was the first one. He comes in with his push kick, and this is when, again, from this far out, he's got decent off uh, defense. He can get out of the way, slips off, or just leans off the center line when he throws, right? He's fine that way. But you, when you begin to crowd him, all of that goes away. You see it here. This was the first time he really landed. Throws this kick, then he gets the reaction from Marlin, and then he begins to throw. And what, look at what happens as, as a consequence. Kick, duck, punch, push. Now look at, the, look at the response from Marlin here. He's throwing a hook. Even if this hook lands, it wouldn't knock anyone out. There's no power under his feet like that. Look at that. There's no power. Then I think a light bulb went off in his head for uh, Henry Cejudo. Again, look at how far apart they are. He tries to punch at this distance. Marlin can see it coming, and he slips, but he gets out of the way. But that was the lesson there. Like, if you're, if you're firing a left way far away, it's just too far. Here we are in the second round. Now, this is where things begin to change a little bit, but you can see he's getting after him. Now he's getting in his grill. Look at this. Getting in his grill a little bit, staying in his face. Now look at the daylight between them, huh? much, much less daylight, significantly less daylight. And he's all over him here. Now, what? at first, he doesn't know exactly what to throw, but he's, he's staying up in his grill. Look at this. Comes over the top. He fakes it a little bit here, right? He kind of lowers his level. He kind of brings it from his hip, so you can't quite tell where it's coming. Can't quite see it. 
And what do you notice? It lands. When you're this close to him and you're throwing a right that you've disguised or drawn out a reaction on, he doesn't have the same head movement. Again, I'm not saying every opponent can do this, but in this fight, that's the lesson. And you keep going. Again, frictionless right hand. I want to land as often and as short distance as possible. Right? He goes, he goes high. He fakes. Boom. Now, he eats one here, but look what he's trying to do. He's up in him. And look at the balance of Marlon Moraes. He will throw in close quarters to react to you. But if you're crowding him, you can disrupt everything. Look at this. He's got... As my man self-titled would say, he's got gangsters leaning to the side like italic letters, right? Look at that. Boom. He's, now he's begun to figure it out a little bit, switching stances. By the way, Marlon is circling this way. So what do you expect might happen? Let's see. Catches him moving in a little bit. Now, Marlon was good with the kick there, so that was a little bit even. Pushes him back, stays in his grill. He kind of fakes low, comes high again. This time Marlon anticipated it, but what does he do? Stays up in his grill. Stays up in his grill. He's fading into the right hand here, right? Going this direction. Fading into the right hand. Stays in his grill. Pop. Catches him. Which way is Marlon moving? This way. So what do you think is going to happen? Whoop. And he kind of double pumps on it there just a little bit. Like a little bit of delayed timing on it. Catches him. By the way, where's the head movement? Watch Marlon's head. It's just the speed, the timing. There's a big opening here. And as a consequence, he takes advantage of it over and over and over again. There he is. Look at him staying with the right hand, too. A lot of people think that you have to go side to side with strikes. Sometimes you can. Sometimes you don't have to. Boom. Uppercut. Stays on him. Right hand. Right hand. And again, quick. He kind of gets a little bit out of the way there, but still, Henry's on him. In his face. No more daylight. And look at how everything just goes away. Look at how Marlon can't set. Look at how Marlon can't anticipate. If you want to fence at distance, he can anticipate. If you want to get up in there, he can't. Not with Henry, anyway. And again, what happens here? He's fading this direction. So what do you think is going to happen? Pop, catches him right down the middle of the gloves. Right in that center spot. Pretty nicely done. All over him. All over him. Pop, no setup. Boom, where's the, where's the head movement? There is none. Now Marlon, you know, he's trying to fight back. Boom, right hand, ducking, getting out of the way, resetting, up in his grill. Let's look for a frictionless right hand. There it is. Jab, pushing him back, jab, pushing him back. No head movement. Now I can grab. Boom, knee, fake to a right hand. Over and over and over again. Right hand, over again, pushing him back. Right hand again. And this is what I mean when I say he has a good chin. Who could take this? Pop. Not everybody. Look at look at Cejudo's head. Whack. He's got a good chin, man. Like Marlon can thump. And so that, that tells you a lot. But then he clinches, and he's just all over him here. Boom. All over. By the way, it's a nice, nice uh, sh head shot on the exit there from Marlon. But he's all banged up here. Boom. Right hand. He's just finding it over and over again. If you can crowd the space from that right side... He's just not, in this fight, capable of making a quick read from that right side. He just can't read. So here it comes over and over and over again. Boom. And what does he do from this spot? He just kind of defends. He just kind of hangs out. He's just getting banged on here. Again, look at how often the first punch is measure right hand. And you see Marlon getting off a little bit, right? But for the most part, that defense is just not there. Here we are, third round, very quickly. What's he doing here? F measuring banging, getting inside, pushing, banging, right hand. Where's he moving into? This side. What do you think is going to happen? He's going to go that side again. Again, this is what I mean when I say Cejudo just read this stuff really well. Gets in on him, goes for a trip, can't turn his mat, his uh, hips over. His hips are still facing, so the takedown doesn't work. But he's all up in his grill. Frictionless right hand. Eats the punch. Stays on him. Right hand. Right uppercut. Right hand, right? Look at this. There's, look at the feet of, of Marlon. They never set. Nothing ever sets. Bang. Over and over again. Bang. Clinches up. Here we are. Oops. Almost done. All right. Nearly gets the takedown. 
comes over here. Uh, real quickly, why did this gator roll not work? Why did it not work? All right, so this part is nice. So this is your gator roll right here, right? This is called a gator roll. It's an anaconda choke that he's got set up. Why did the gator roll not work? All right, so he's got, it looks like it's locked up here, but there's not enough because there's not really a choke from this position. You can't really, there's no, you're not collapsing it enough. So why did it not work? Here's why it didn't work. Shouts to Danny Ives uh, at Ivy League MMA in Annapolis, Maryland. He showed me this 15 years ago. This is the best tip I've ever gotten for this position. Here is what he told me. You don't roll straight over. It's too hard. And there's not enough. They, you can't control the body enough. What you really want is you want to dip your head into this pocket at an angle. And as a consequence, you're going to come up through, which is going to allow you to hook the top leg. Actually, I think it's the other one. It's going to allow you to hook the top leg. And when you do, that's when you can squeeze everything together. Watch what Henry does here. He just goes and rolls kind of over. And so... You can't take him off of his base that way. When you get into the pocket, excuse me, when you get into the pocket, it actually turns them off their base. It actually lifts this side a little bit easier, so they come over. Best tip I've ever gotten, man. If you Put your head inside the hole at an angle. It makes it so much better. Anyway, so he doesn't, and as a consequence, he's still based out. So then he just kind of goes to his back to loosen the grip and then comes back to his base. But okay, you can put the... Uh, you can put the thumbnail up here. What is the fundamental lesson? It was that this guy realized at space, I'm not having any luck. And he tried a different, a couple of entries to land the right hand. Initial ones coming off of a kick to close distance and then finding another one. He liked what he saw, so he built off of that, closed it, found the frictionless one. Didn't matter if he was standing this side or this side. Didn't matter which way Marlon was circling. Marlon is one fighter way at a distance. Against Henry in close, he was a completely different fighter. Once he discovered that, it wasn't broke. No need to fix it. That's your Monday Morning Analyst. Woo! All right, all right, all right. Okay. I'm going to have some coffee here. This will be my second cup of the day. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Mmm. All right, we've got to get to some calls here. I went a little long, as I am normally wont to do. Uh, I am told that we had a gazillion calls, by the way. I am told that the number of calls was astronomically high, which I always like hearing. I always like hearing that. Joe, we ready or what? Uh, Almost? One minute. one minute. Anyway, I'm told we had a bunch of tweets as well. So thank you to everyone who sent those tweets. Keep sending them using the hashtag TheMMAHour. Keep calling 844 866 Two four six eight. If you want to turn that off or just flip the lid on it when you get a chance. Thank you, Joe. Um, and we will get going here with the calls. Yes, indeed, we will. I was going to do tweets, but I'd rather just do calls and then do tweets at the end of the show because calls are better. I like them more. Um, all right, we ready back there, boys? What's the word? Yes, no? All right, let's do it. Time now for the sound off. Okay, let's go to my man here in the back, Danny Segura. He's there somewhere. There he is, Bigote himself. How are you, sir? I'm good, yeah. You can see Casey back there. I see Casey. Yeah, he's out there. Wait, it's, it's Dos Bigotes. Dos Bigotes, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Uh, all right, well, nice to see you both, I suppose. Uh, I heard, you, as you told me, the calls, many of them, I see. Man, we had a ridiculous amount of calls. Pe it was overwhelming. People were fact, fired up. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I mean, the this was one of the best cards I've seen in a long time. That was great. Probably the best in 2019. Yep. We actually have a question about that. All right. So. All right. Let's, let's just Seriously. waste not another minute. All right. Well, there's a lot of pressing matters, but there's none more important than this one. Uh, a tweet came out recently, so I thought we should address it. So let's discuss that. Hey, Luke and Danny. This is Matthew calling from the armpit of the world, Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. My question is, um, Justin Bieber just made a tweet saying, tagging Dana White and asking um, if he was interested in putting on a fight between him and Tom Cruise. Now, this is obviously kind of ridiculous, but I guess my next kind of. my question would be, do you ever think we'll see two celebrities fight the Octagon? And if you guys could pick two celebrities to fight the Octagon, which one would you just pick? And 
my apologies for the really ridiculous question, but it is sort of newsworthy. Thanks. Yeah, here's the answer. You've already seen a celebrity in CM Punk or Brock Lesnar, either one. Beaver versus Cruz. Who you got? I let me let me explain something to you. I would rather. What would I rather do? Hmm. I would rather watch my family get set on fire in front. I'd rather watch every member of my family, male or female, be honor killed in front of me than spend five seconds thinking about that fight. How about that? Well, I got Beaver. I think he'd piece him. Up. He'd piece Cruz up. Beaver wouldn't piece up uh, a kid. He trains with Floyd, though. Beaver wouldn't piece. He trains with Floyd. Yeah, does he? He wouldn't. He does. He wouldn't piece up a kid's meal, please. Um, these guys who've never been in a confrontation in their life, and not that I'm Billy Badass, far from it. As a street fighter, I'm about 500, bro. I'm a journeyman on the street. I am no more, no less. But at least, you know, a couple times I've had to, like, take care of myself to varying degrees of success. These people who've had security around them a few, a few times, they they have they live in a different universe, bro. And I take him. Let me tell you how seriously I take him. About as seriously as Drake, which is to say, not at all. Not at all. How dare you two, question two, Justin Bieber, Two man. zeros who know nothing about the real world. F them both. <laughs> all right, well, let's talk about some real fighting now. And, uh, you know, Henry Cejudo picked up a huge win. I think in a lot of people's eyes, he, he started, uh, I guess, entering that pound for pound conversation. So let's Certainly discuss did. what's next for him. Hey, Luke, this is Peter Dempsey from uh, Yonkers, New York, the Lost Borough. I just wanted to ask about uh, Henry Cejudo and what's next for him. I don't see any way they could let him fight Cruz. Definitely not Garbrandt or whoever else he was mentioning. I see maybe Sterling. I don't know who else. It could be, but I'd love to hear your take on it. Thanks, Luke. Thanks for everything. Yeah, apparently he wants to fight all of Ali's other clients. <laughs> He's got a bunch Everyone of them. Everyone who's not yeah. a top contender. He's got a bunch basically. of them. Yeah, it was funny, all the names he yeah. called out, because we know that, remember, Garbrandt was supposed to fight in the July show of Sacramento, yep. and he and his manager both said no. Ali told us that here. And then... Um, and then uh, Cruz is out for the foreseeable future. I, I mean, I know he's still rehabbing and he's training, but yeah. I don't know how ready he is. It was funny he didn't mention any of the top contenders. He just wanted other people with names. It's amazing that these guys, they want to prove themselves against the best fighters that they can. And this was something of a vanity fight, but also a very tough one. Yes. And then when they get to that space, they're like, I am done with the donks. I want to fight. Uh, when I say that, I mean name value. I yeah. want to fight anyone and everyone who's on anyone else's radar. It, it, this is what that pay structure incentivizes, to be quite candid with you. Boxers will fight nobody with any name because they're going to get 40 mil to do it. Triple G, exactly. Triple yeah. G fighting, you know, he's out here just fighting. I mean, I don't want to be disrespectful, but that guy had nothing for him. Uh, and he still got paid to do it. Yeah. The reason why these guys are calling out people with names is because those are the ways they're going to maximize their pay. You want them to stop doing that? Give them a check to fight Aljamain Sterling because Aljamain Sterling, Danny Segura, is your top contender. You think that you think that's the fight to make? It's that or Joe B, right? I like the Joe B fight a lot. You like that one more? Think, uh, yeah, because I feel like Sterling with this win, he just got to the queue, right to the front of the line. Um, whereas Joe B has been there for a minute, and he has a win over Sohudo. Yeah, so. but he also has a fight at the end of the month. Yeah, well, b because he's had no option but to you know keep busy. So I, I think that should be next. And look, I'm all in, I'm I'm all about flyweight. I like the flyweight division. I don't know why it's going away, but or apparently not going away. Um, but I think I think that's the fight to make. And I think if you are going to dissolve it, I think Joe B should be at least uh, the last man to 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 get a crack at that belt. Did you see uh, Dana White's interviews or like uh, things with yeah. uh, Aaron Bronstetter? Yeah, I did. <laughs> it's like, can he answer Aaron's questions without being like awful or rude every single time? Is that possible? For Dana, it's like Aaron asking the most fair, utterly reasonable questions. Yeah. It's like, what do you mean by the word gone? Have I said it's gone? Well, then if I didn't say the word gone, then it's definitely yeah, not yeah. gone. It's like, meanwhile, the division has been decimated. I think there's like 10 flyweights left or something. It's just, okay, which is fine. Like, just say, yeah, we're going to keep it around like women's featherweight. It's going to be like the men's right. version of women's featherweight. We're just going to have it float in the background as we need it. We will use it. And that's just what it's going to be. Okay. All right. Yeah. Fine. You know. Yeah, I mean, they're pretty upfront about, you know, women's featherweight. Why can't they be about flyweight, you know, men's flyweight? I don't know. Yeah, it's a weird one. All right, well, as I said at the top, Cejudo, you know, in, in a lot of people's eyes, not only became, started, you know, became, came into that pound for pound great uh, conversation, but also just in combat sports athletes in general. Yeah. I think uh, a lot of people are considered to be, you know, one of the best. Here's so. the thing. I haven't done pound for pound rankings hey, in yeah. literally years. So I don't know how I would answer that one anymore. But certainly I would say this, man. I don't 
think he's at the top of pound for pound, but he needs to be taken a lot more seriously than he has been. I think at a bare minimum. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Well, let's let's listen to this question and okay. discuss Wait, it. It's Paul from Chicago. Chicago. What do you think about Henry Cejudo's claim that he's the greatest combat sports athlete of all time? My opinion is definitely got to be up there, but I wouldn't give it to him. Because the reason he considers himself to be that, or one of the main reasons he considers himself to be that, is because of his wrestling accolades. And I think wrestling is a more limited type of combat sport. And if you're choosing the greatest combat sports athlete, it should be the closest to um, a fighting situation with reasonable restrictions, like the rules they have in place in MMA. Essentially the greatest MMA fighter of all time. All right, I'm going to cut it right These there. These MMA fans will twist. It's a great question, but MMA fans will twist themselves into a knot to yeah. say that other combat sports are limited. Let me explain something to you. Wrestling has been around for literally hundreds, if not thousands of years. Thousands of years. Okay? Yeah. And at this current level, the participatory rate of wrestling as a global sport, like how many people compete in it, is infinitely higher than MMA. There are structures in place in which to advance. In other words, to get to the highest level and stay at the highest level in wrestling, I have terrible news for MMA fans. It is way harder to do that than it is to become a high-level UFC uh, fighter. That's just a fact. It's not up for debate. It's just the reality of things. Consider Cormier made two Olympic teams. Henry could only make one. Yeah. Now, he got his act together, and this latest run, I don't mean to demean it, it's incredible. He is certainly, I think, Danny, one of the more versatile combat athletes of all time because he did well in boxing at the amateur level. Uh, obviously, his wrestling in the Olympic medal, amazing. And now what he's doing in MMA, hey, man, he's got something going here. And as I mentioned, his ability to dig deep. But, like, dude, do you understand what it takes to make four Olympic cycles and then medal in all of them? Like an Alexander Carolyn or something? Yeah. When yet the highest level of the game in a sport that has super refined, super refined skills, it's more limited, but it's much harder to master. Uh, and everybody in the world does it, and you're stomping on them for 16 years? That's harder to do. It's super hard. And, and we're discussing here, you know, the greatest uh, combat sports athlete. We're not discussing the greatest MMA fighter. So it includes, you know, all combat sports, no matter how limited or limited you think they are. So Henry Saudo has definitely, I, I, in my opinion, I mean, I've yet to make the list. So I can't think, you know, I can't think of others, that, you know, right away. But like. Cejudo, not only is it was he amazing at wrestling, but like look what he's doing in MMA. It's not like he's going out there and out wrestling people. Like he he was beating. He is as needed. He, he did to yeah, Johnson. He, well, yeah, that's true. But like for example, against uh, Moraes, he was doing great in the striking, right. like especially in that second and third round. Right. So here's what I would say, dude. Pretty pretty incredible the look, fact that like he's gotten so good in the striking, yet wrestling is his base. Give him his due. What he did on Saturday is incredible, and him making that claim, I don't think it's true. But in him making it, I think he has a right to say things like that. Certainly yeah. he, he feels that way. It makes for an interesting conversation. I think he has the right to bring it up. Like, okay, where does he rank among combat athletes? What he's doing is, is literally unique because no one else has won an Olympic medal at a gold medal and then become a two-division champion. It's never happened before. At the same time, when you just ask about, like, Lomachenko, two gold medals, 300 amateur wins, people are like, oh, boxing's more limited. Do you know how much more refined... Lomachenko's striking skills are than anyone in the UFC. It's not even close. They're not even in the same universe. That's why all the UFC champs want to train with that guy. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, they'd be like, well, it's more limited. Yes, and therefore less refined. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, let's talk about Tony Ferguson. And it feels like he's getting a lot more support nowadays than, than uh, in his previous Not bouts. from Dana. Fan support. Hey, it's Darren calling from Toronto. Uh, hey, Luke and Danny, I just wanted to talk about Tony Ferguson for a bit. A boot. I've been watching him for a while and observed that since the Pettis fight and the whole mental health story came out, he seems to have a lot. He seems to have gained a lot of more fans and fan support. Uh, even when you read his social media or video comments, the, uh, they're almost all positive and rally for him to get the next title shot. Uh, everyone seems to love him now, and he seems to have a ton of more fans. Have you guys noticed this as well, or is it just me? Uh, and that being said, how much value do you think that actually adds to him getting the next title shot? And if you had to take a guess, do you think Tony fights for the belt in 2019? Okay, thanks a lot, guys. I, I think definitely not in 2019, but maybe in 2020. Yeah, they're not going to give him the next fight. 
I mean, they're setting it all up to not give him the yeah. next fight. But say, like, negotiations go wrong with, with Connor. Then, then, then he would get Tony's it. It's, it's, the the, guy, it's, yeah. it's the same situation as uh, DC, Brock, and Stipe. To the extent Brock walks, sure, they'll do a, they'll do a rematch. Right. Like, you know? Yeah. It's the same thing in this one. To the extent that Connor can't get a deal done, sure, Tony's in great. If they get a deal done with Connor, forget it. Especially, by the way, now, if Poirier wins, I don't know exactly how that changes it because obviously Connor beat Poirier before. So they could just do a rematch there. I, I, I don't. I, that, that's a bit of a weird scenario. It is, yeah. Because also Habib, still the bigger fight is with Habib, and also Habib might want an immediate rematch. Because by the way, he was undefeated. You're the first person to beat him. That's right. So that could throw There's a wrench. A lot of things up in the right. Area. So that could throw a wrench in the place. But if Habib wins and they get a deal done with Connor, Tony's going to get r- railroaded. It, you, they're already setting it up. Which, yeah. by the way, like women. So I saw this on like MMA History Today. Women didn't even fight in the UFC the last time he lost. I mean. <laughs> What? I can't believe this guy. That, has... that was what, 2009, I think? No, 2012. 12, yeah. He, uh, he'd been fighting since before. I had just graduated high school. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what are we My doing? first year of college. What are we doing, dude? What are yeah, we doing? It's, it's crazy. It's insane. But, like, have you noticed that like, a lot of people are supporting Tony Ferguson a lot more? I feel like early on, he caught a lot, a lot of hate. Uh, and he was, in a way, kind of feels like he was in that Sahuda situation where, like, he was a bit cringy and fans were just hating on him. Yeah. But like, you know, they just came around, and I feel like he's getting all the support in the world. Here's the deal. We talked about. Here's it. the deal with cringe, and this I got bad news for people who don't like Colby Covington. If he beats Kamaru Usman, he's still gonna have a degree of haters because that's the he he provokes more. Yeah. But if you you can be cringe all you want, if you're cringe and winning, it automatically over time just becomes charming. That's just the reality of it. People were like, they couldn't stand Tony Ferguson before. You think Covington will become charming? Uh, I think he'll become more charming than he, I think he'll become much more, lo- if he goes out there and puts it on Kamar Usman, you watch how fan sentiment turns. Don't misunderstand me. Not the same as yeah. Tony. Far from it. Yeah, I think his, his type of cringe is a little different. It is a little different. I acknowledge yeah. it's different. But what I'm saying is, if you think that the dynamic of, of fans that it is now with Colby is going to be the same if he beats Kamaru, I think you'll be surprised. Yeah. Brendan Chop style, you'd be surprised. We'll see. Uh, so about Cejudo and possibly going up to 145? Hey, from Mawa, New Jersey. Um, hopefully you finally answer my question. It's been a while. Um, He's got so bitter. Your that. chance. So um, entitled. No, nah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, on, it's, you know, Henry Soto talked about moving up in weight class. Uh, by featherweight. What do you think he could possibly win another title at featherweight? Um, I know styles make matchups, but it seems like if he could get in there and do dirty boxing with his wrestling, I think there's a chance that he could become a three-time a three division champion. What's your thoughts on that? And do you think it's impossible for him to win that? Thanks. Well, here's the thing. Like Justin Bieber said, never say never. Never. But is that a song? I think that's what he said. I'm pretty sure. Maybe. Anyways, but I don't know. Sahudo, look, there was a clear difference between Moraes and, and Sahudo. Not huge, but Moraes, I don't think he's a, a huge bantamweight. Man, 145 is just, I think it's too much to ask. So m- remember what I just went over there in the uh, Monday Morning Analyst. At distance, what was happening, right? Marlon was tearing him yeah. up because at that style of play, he's so much more gifted. Marlon has a reach of 67. All right, so let's play that game, 67 inches. So let's play that game with Max Holloway, for example. By the way, there are other featherweights he could fight. I mean, who knows right. um, who would be up there at the time. But let's just say they said, you know what? Let's see if we can get a triple champ on our hands, which, by the way, is eventually going to happen. Now, Holloway is only at 69 inches, which is a couple more, but he's also a lot taller. So having to punch up. Max is also one of these weird fighters where he's very tall, but his reach is actually not that not that long. Right, but he, but he uses it really well. Yeah, he does. He gets every inch out of it. And the point being is he's also tall. He's really good at playing that outside game and then forcing people not only back, but he, he uh, stops the clinch pretty well. To me... When you have stellar takedown defense, you're not only good at the outside, but you're good at maintaining the outside. Marlon's problem was he couldn't maintain the outside space. He kept getting he kept getting overrun. The waves kept crashing past yeah. the barrier. They don't really hasn't really happen with Max. So um, let's see how we. By the way, let him fight other bantamweights to see how this goes. Some other bantamweights going to beat him eventually. I think probably that's how history has typically worked. Maybe another flyweight does. You never yeah. know. But the, I'm not saying no to the featherweight thing. I'm just saying plenty of reasons to think he's going to have some problems there. I think I think some matchups could event, benefit him at featherweight, but again, with small featherweights, but if you like just start reading like the top five of the featherweight division, like Alexander Volkanovsky, that guy's big. Uh, Brown Ortega's pretty big. Jose Aldo's big. Like, I feel like 
I don't know. I, I just don't see him. I just don't see him doing well at 145. And, and not because he's not skilled. It's just the size difference is going to be. Yeah, but eventually weight classes matter. Yeah, they're in for a reason, right? Yeah. They're in place for a reason. Yeah. All right. Well, let's discuss now what's next for Valentina. Oof, that that win was. Surprise, bro. Hey, it's Rich P representing Las Vegas, Nevada. We just watched Valentina murder Jessica I in there. <laughs> My only question is, what's next for her? Does the UFC get behind her like? Full guns blazing, promotion, everything. And uh, who's her next opponent? Who wants to step in there? For real. Thank Who you. wants to step in there, dude? Kayla Shukagian says she wants that smoke. Um, I mean, I'm sure fighters do, of course. But, man, that was scary. That was a super scary performance. Yeah, that was really scary. Yeah. That was um, – and it was really bad. That was really bad. I made this point, again, on my personal uh, post-fight special, which was um, – you know, what do you do when your top contenders, like the most deserving person in a division, is so far behind the champ that it ends up being a mismatch? What how do you how do you book around that? People are like, oh, they did that for DJ for years. Sort of. The Carriasso fight and the Borg fight were the only two fights that he had in terms of mm -hmm. an odds that approximated this one. Um but even then, like could she honestly have a series of defenses, let's say four or more? where she's a minus 1,000 favorite in all of them, it's honestly possible. And that would be unheard of in the UFC. Yeah. That would be totally unheard yeah. of. We might get something like that with her. Uh, yeah. She is. Have you ever seen her in person? Have I met her in person? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know how fighters imagine. I don't know how people who've never met fighters, how they imagine how they look. Yeah. I once I've had Kayla Harrison in the studio on my radio show. Dude, Kayla Harrison is jacked. Okay, she's super jacked. Yeah. There's... Like, okay, so I asked you this before. You've seen Yoel Romero in person, right? Yeah. Dude, when Yoel walks around, he doesn't look like a normal person. No. He looks like a – he looks like he was written by a comic book yeah. uh, artist. That's how Shevchenko looks. She looks – she's not like a bodybuilder huge, but what muscle she has, like nothing jiggles. She just – she's just super Yeah, she looks very, chiseled. very dense. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, dense. And, um, and when you add that with someone who's been doing this for as long as she has – and she has skills as refined as she does. I, I went back and I showed you the timing on the kick. Yeah, she's so technical. It's just dude, these, so these, technical. these other women. They're not even. They're not even. She here's how she's going to lose. She has to be sick, injured, or make a very serious mistake. Yeah. Other than that, she ain't losing. Or, or who knows? Maybe like in the next two, three years, uh, some contender rises up, or some you know somebody from another promotion comes in, and you know. Maybe... Macy Barber is interesting. Macy Barber is interesting. Well, look, am I saying she's ready now? No, 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 no. In a couple of years, let's see. Let's see how she looks in a couple of years. Yeah. But, like, that's the time horizon that we're talking about here. Yeah. I also think, uh, you know, in discussing what's next, I think, you know, if they ever run back Nunes versus Shevchenko, I think, you know, there's a possibility Valentina can definitely lose there. I mean, she's lost twice, technically, to uh, Nunes. Yeah. Um, but I think at 125, good luck, good luck stopping her. I don't know. I don't know who it's going to be. And by the way, I, again, I'll say it again. I thought she beat Nunes the second time. The second time, yeah. I, I I remember it being close, Very but I but I don't. I, I feel like I scored it for Nunes. Yeah, I might have scored it for Nunes, but it was super close fight. Reasonable people can disagree. Doesn't it make it more interesting now with this uh, with these results? Yeah. Let's see what happens with a home. But I mean, we could potentially have another like super fight in the making if uh, you know the stars align. Yep. All right. Now let's discuss. Um, I guess. You know, looking back now, people were a little bit upset that, you know, Ferguson, Cerrone wasn't headlining this car. So let's discuss that, you know, looking back. Hi, my name's Hayden. I'm calling from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. I called earlier for my question, but now I remember. <laughs> I'm rewatching the uh, the Tony Cowboy like, oh. fight, and honestly, it's the biggest disappointment I think I've ever seen And really, the UFC. We have three rounds that got robbed by a doctor where it was uh, beautiful. Robbed by a doctor. And then we watched two fights that I would believe did not deserve to be over this fight. What is your opinion on star power compared to title fights? Because obviously on this card, title fights are more important than star power. And I think Connor never fights again because of that. Let me know. Thank you. Can we just address the robbed by the doctor claim here very quickly? Bro, come on. They should have let him fight. Like He, like, he had one eye. Like, what is, like, the the, guy, the caller's like, hey, uh, is this the Luke Thomas and Danny Segura show? Hey, man, these doctors got some nerve upholding the Hippocratic Oath. Like, who thinks that way? I don't even understand. Like, what do you want to do? Do you want to look at that eye and be like, nah, they're good? 
Yeah. The first, do no harm. Dingleberries. Like, how was this? A th- okay. All right. Neither here nor there. Yeah. Um, here's the thing. I have come around on this one, Danny. Would you have been opposed if they had put Tony versus Ferg? Sorry, Tony versus Cerrone. Yeah. At the top of that card. Yes or no? Yes, I would. Okay, tell me why. I like the title fights on top, man. Okay. I feel like the title fights, you know, they, they've been devalued over time, but I think we, we need to pay respect for the for the people that made it to the top, right? Uh, for the people that are fighting for gold. And look, Tony Ferguson, you can make an argument that Tony Ferguson and Don Cerrone are deserving for, for, for a title shot, and they should have been fighting for a title a while back. But nonetheless, it's not an official title fight, and I feel like that should always go over no matter how big the fight is. I think you can maybe make some exceptions, say Ronda and Connor, say if Ronda ever comes back. But mm-hmm. other than that, title should go first. And and that's why I'm all for um, Ro- Bellator putting Rory McDonald and Neiman Gracie over mm-hmm. Machida and Sonny. Mm-hmm. You feel the same way? Uh, I don't. Um, well, here's what I mean. I don't disagree with anything you said. Like, yeah. if they want to make titles at the top of cards, that's fine. Here's the thing that MMA fans and journalists too, by the way, because they make this mistake as often as everybody else does, if not worse. You have UFC leadership under sworn deposition saying, guys, the titles don't mean anything. It's just a trophy we hand out to the best fighter yeah. at the end of the night. Well, who said that? Because I feel Lawrence like you're, Epstein. You're... Lawrence Epstein said it, uh, who is a key figure in that organization. He said it quite plainly. I, mean, I believe Lorenzo Fertitta may have repeated it as well. Uh, it is a core conviction of theirs. When 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 push came to shove, what the organization maintains is that it doesn't mean anything other than it's something we give to the best fighter that night. Well, if that's the case, then why am I asked to hold it in reverence? And if that's the case, sure, put Tony versus Cerrone at the top of the card. In other words, I like what you said, Danny. There's something to be said for really accomplished people getting featured in really prominent spots, and I think that's fine. Yeah. But I don't know why we're asked to believe something that's a fiction. It is a fiction that it means, according to UFC Brass, we can, you and I can put value yeah. on top of it. But at the end of the day, it's not the Danny Segura title, and it ain't the Luke Thomas title, it ain't the MMA Hour title. It's the UFC title. The only value is what they put on it. Under sworn testimony, it has none. So if that's the case, why am I asked to care? And uh, by the way, why shouldn't Tony be at the top of that card? Hello? He was far and away the biggest star on that card, not even a close second. Well, I guess Cerrone was the close second. That's it. Right. Uh, still, I don't know. Called me old school, but I think titles should go last. Also, like, yeah, it, it would just feel weird to have, like, you know, some, some ch- like, crowning a champion, yet, you know, then you put on a regular fight just right after. Like, it just feels anticlimactic. I don't know. Uh, what's the word on Mr. Caldwell? We got an issue? Uh, I texted, um, the people on the, uh, involved in yes. the show and, uh, we're still looking into it. Okay. He's not here. No, not, <laughs> uh, he hasn't gone back to me. Um, oh, sweet. so let's answer another question. That's awesome. Let's talk about another fighter that was, <laughs> all right. Sorry. Sorry. It's just, uh, it? yeah, it's just my life. My life is, is just a fair ago of nonsense. Go ahead. Right. Let's talk about another fighter who, who did quite well. And I feel like. You know, she's being forgotten about here with all these uh, crazy finishes that we saw. Hey, guys, it's Joshy Fresh from San Diego again. I just got done watching the Carolina versus Grasso fight, and oh, my goodness. Did you expect Grasso to come out looking the way she did? She basically outclassed Carolina, which I don't remember another fighter doing in recent times. Do we have a future star on our hands? Keep up the great work, guys. Peace. With Carolina? Uh, I'm sorry, with Grasso. Think of performance, Man, yeah. You know, here's the thing. If anyone's ever trained, you'll spend uh, quite literally, it's possible. To, I've seen guys who are like, I trained for six months, I got blue belt. I trained for another two years, I got purple. And then I was purple for five years. There can be moments in your career where you just progress like this, and then you just plateau. And I felt like Grasso had kind of plateaued for a little while, except in this last fight, she whatever stasis she was in she had clearly zoomed past made tons of progress conversely Karolina Kovalkiewicz appears to have entered some kind of situation where she is now in a what do you want to say a battle for um uh, she's stuck she's stuck in the mud so it's these moments where you can progress 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 and these moments where you can just train hard and you just can't get better and then all of a sudden it clicks yeah I think that's what happened here 
also, you know, I feel like Grasso was given some tough matchups, especially like the Tatiana Suarez one was was, was a really tough matchup yep. with with Karolina Kolokevich. She really got an opportunity to like showcase her skill because it was someone that is very tough, very skilled, and very experienced as well. But her skill set played well into her, so um, it really brought up the the best out of her, and and that was you know it was nice to watch. Well, let me ask you a question: Do you need to make a phone call to find Mr. Caldwell? Yeah, do you want me to leave you with? Yeah, leave with me with call? leave me with a call, and All then right. the camera will go on me, and then you figure this out because right. I would yeah, yeah. I would like to talk to Darian. Yeah, it'd be nice if he was here. Yeah, we we are waiting for him. All right, let's talk about Mr. Chris Weidman. Uh, really? Okay. Yeah. You, you uh, well, I did the not. Call, the caller will take care of. I did not pay attention to what he had to say. Okay, go ahead. Yo, yo, Luke, Danny, Nino from Washington Township, New Jersey. How you doing? Got a question here for Terrible. you. So recently, Chris Weidman has come out and said that he would like to move up to 205 pounds. Good. I just want to know who you think would be a good matchup for his first uh, roundabout at 205. Whew. Obviously, a lot of middleweights have been moving up, like uh, Anthony Smith, Thiago Santos. They're having They're having success. Uh, Luke Rockhold just moved up also. I just want to know, if you think Chris Wyman's going to have a lot of success at 205, and who do you think he's going to he's gonna get for his first matchup, or who, or who would make sense for his first matchup? Thank you, guys. Love your show. Have a good day. Uh, good question. I did not know he had said that, so that's interesting. I would say, um, what about Shogun? What about Shogun for his first match? You'd be like, oh, my God, Shogun should be done. Okay, well, if he's not going to be done. Then how about that? I, by the way, I gotta say this. I love the idea of Chris Weidman going up to 205 pounds. I think it's long overdue. Chris Weidman has a ton of ability. Um, he has a ton left to, to offer the game. And with people getting a little bit older, putting less stress on their body to make a certain weight, which allows for extra time for skill development. It's just so important. And so you've seen what Anthony Smith has been able to do. You can say, oh, well, he fought in a lesser division when he went up. Right. Except he also clearly got better, too, because he had time in each camp to invest. He had time in each camp um, to just work on skills rather than, oh, we got to go do uh, some high-intensity interval training. Uh we have to go do road work. We have to go do X. We have to go do Y. We have to go do Z. Instead, we can just invest in the skills. And so I think that would be a huge, huge component. Plus, you could do a Luke Rockhold rematch up there. I don't know about for their first fight. Um, but like, here's the top, here's outside the top 10, because I wouldn't give him somebody in the top 10. You got Alexander Rakic at 11. Rakic, I would preserve for somebody else moving up the chain. Maybe they could fight at a later date, but uh, Johnny Walker at 12, same kind of thing. 13 is Shogun, 14 Sirkinov, or 15 Krilov. Any of those, I think, would be good. All right, I'm told we actually now have Mr. Caldwell uh, here. Let's bring him on in. He fights this weekend. Maybe the best fight of the weekend. He takes on Kyoji Horiguchi in the long-awaited rematch. There he is. There he is, Mr. Wolfpack himself. How are you, sir? Luke, how you doing, baby? Good. Nice to meet you. Have a seat, my friend. Yes, sir. I thought we were going to lose you there for a little while. Not at all. I'm here, baby. How are you? I'm good, man. Yeah? Yes. How, you've, been, you've been in New York City before, yeah? Absolutely. I'm a Jersey boy. Oh, that's right. Yes. How, how could I possibly forget? How could I forget? So you're going to have a ton of fam there? Absolutely. Yeah? You like it that way? Yeah, man. I love uh, I love the support. You know, the more support, the better. Uh, when you wrestled, did you have a ton of fam come? Absolutely. By the way, I've always been to what, uh, ask you this. How did you end up at NC State of all places? Now, I know they had, like, uh, Gwizdowski. They've got a decent program there, but, like, you were, like, the top dog. I don't mean to demean NC State. It's a fine program. Well, but before, you had you could have gone anywhere. So I guess what I'm saying. For sure, I, I definitely could have gone anywhere. Before I went to NC State, it wasn't really a, a traditional uh, wrestling school in you know, a program. I, I feel like uh, when I beat Metcalf and I, I, I brought some some spotlight into the organization is when uh, you know you see the G Wizards and you see the uh, uh, Kevin Jackson, mm. you see all the other other uh, studs come up across the you know that platform. But I f really feel like I, I catapulted the. Uh, the Wolfpack Wrestling Club in 2009 when I won uh, the NCAA championship. Before then, it wasn't an All-American since like 1992. So, um, big reason that why I went there was we had uh, Tony Davis there. Uh, he was a national champ at uh, uh, Northern Iowa, and, mm. and so uh, he was real vocal and really just hands-on, hands-on in my college career. And so I just really took a liking to his style, and uh, it fit me well. Have you do you go back at all? 
Uh, I've been back. I actually went back uh, September last September. We had a golf out, and they brought a, brought a, a bunch of alumni there. Are you a big golfer? Not at all. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just, yeah, nah, not at all. I went there for the shits and giggles. Yeah. Did you go see the college kids? They Absolutely. look so young. How old are you now? 31? 31. They must look super young to you. Yeah, and they're big and they're strong, too. I'm like, yeah. yeah, I got in the wrestling room. I'm like, man, they're a different beast over here. Yeah, they're all like Zion Williamson. They're yeah. All, they're all enormous. <laughs> they brought me on the football field. I'm like, man, I don't remember the football players being this big. Maybe it was just I had, like, you see that picture of the cat looking at himself in the mirror and, and, you, and you see a line, on, a line on the other side. Maybe I was just like in that in that mode that whole college my whole college career. Let me ask you this: I think I read this. So part of your wrestling ambitions after college got derailed by shoulder injuries. Yes. Now what what happened to your shoulder? Uh, well, it was a freak accident. Honestly, uh, it was rollerblading, doing some some crazy. Um, That's a very 90, yeah right uh, like, late late '90s thing like, to do. Real talk, like I grew up like skateboard, like trying to skateboard, like you know, uh, just like I like wheels, I like I like uh, things that that uh, are a, a little. Um, edgy, you know, mm. and so um, one night I just happened to like see some kids walking past, and uh, they had on they had rollerblades in their hands. I'm like, oh, what size are they? And uh, they they fit me, and I think it was just like perfect. It was it was just a perfect night for me to get injured. Um, I wound up taking a fall, uh, bust my shoulder up, tried to come back a little early, bust it up again, wrestling uh, Angel Cejudo at the Olympic Training Center. There. Yeah, yeah uh, he he's a he got really strong hips, you know. No I, relation to Henry, I don't believe. No, that's his brother. Is it really? Yeah. So he was at the Olympic Training Center training um, a little bit, and then uh, like I came back like six, seven months after my uh, my initial surgery. Um, uh, now, what what kind of surgery did you get? It was a, uh, just a regular orthoscopic surgery. Was it like labrum or uh, labrum? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had the labrum one as yeah. well, which is why I ask. You know, and and with those, you you got to take your time, bro. You know? And it's especially wrestling, like. Uh, the positions you put yourself in wrestling and just uh, real compromising with the shoulders and and so when I came back I, I think I, I rushed the, the the rehab process and I went out to the Olympic Training Center uh, try to because uh, I, I was doing really well you know before that injury you know and I feel like I, I was at the pinnacle of the sport and I just wanted to get back on top and so I uh, wound up busting up my shoulder again had to get another surgery and, and so my whole I, I redshirted that year before that or after that first surgery uh, came back and then uh, Busted up again, and it was inevitable. Inevitable. I needed another surgery. I didn't get it my se my redshirt senior year. I just kind of wrestled the whole year. Uh, it kept coming in and out. And uh, after after nationals, uh, I didn't do well at nationals. I went like one and two, and then uh, or one, and then I bust my shoulder up in in my second match, and I just forfeited out the tournament. You mm. know? Now, how come it doesn't bother you in MMA, or maybe it does? Uh, well, no, nah, it, it's been so long. You know, a lot of rehab, a lot of recovery. It's been about eight years since my my shoulder has been, uh, been, you know, uh, messed up. So no, no subsequent no, issues. No, nah, no problems. Oh, okay. Even when they, someone's doing kimuras or anything like that. No problems. Oh man, mine that not, never feels the same. Actually, Never. Like I got a, I, I got. Is a, it on your dominant hand or? Yeah, my my dominant hand. So I got a bionic bionic shoulder. Shoulder, you know, it's it's like, I I. I, I I invite you to come try my shoulder. <laughs> Do you have the same range of motion? Absolutely. See, I don't. They purposely when they restitch mine. They purposely limited range. Like I can show you. So like I'm left-handed. Yeah. This is the one I had repaired. So I can take this. I can go this far out. This is my left hand. Man. They purposely stitched it yeah. so that I couldn't. Yeah. Because mine was falling out of my socket in my sleep. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I would be sleeping and just same thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, whoa! What's going on? Hurt like yeah. So bad. For sure. So what they did with mine was they took it and they kind of made it so tight rather than just taking it and like uh, cut like uh, stitching it up here inside. Yeah. They overlapped it and, and it took a while for me to get that range of motion back you know but when I got it back you know it, it, was, it just was regular normal how excited are you for this rematch I gotta I'm tell you excited. I'm super pumped yeah, I'm this might be the best fight on paper this weekend there's some good fights don't get me wrong there's some good fights this I is, think this is the one this is the only one that matters honestly this is the only fight for a real belt this is the only fight that, I mean you got two of the best two of the very best uh, 35 pounders in the world and uh, th to me, this is, and I'm sure that a lot of people, this is the only f fight that matters. All right, so let's talk about the first one. So you go over to Japan. How was the, how was the trip to Japan, by the way? So many people complain about the jet lag. Did the jet lag affect you at all? Uh, I think anything that could have went wrong uh, in Japan, it did. Really? Uh, yeah, I mean. It, but, you were, but you were winning right yeah. up until you weren't, sort of. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I think it was a loss of focus, you know. Um, but uh, mental lapse, you know, and uh, I. I learned from that, you know. I learned learned from there. All right, let's back up a step. You yeah. said anything that could go wrong in Japan did. So let's go through things. What went wrong? Well, uh, usually, you know, let's take yesterday for instance. I, I, I get here in New York, you know, 
five days out from the fight, uh, when right where I want to be. I'm 145 right now, you know. You, well, usually that's where I'm at, you know, when I come in for fight week. Mm -hmm. I got to Japan, I was like 154, 155. You know? mm. So already I'm like fighting, you know, my weight. And then uh, just like the hydration process, like figuring out foods and, you know, figuring out, like we were doing like, like we were like touring the city, like, you know, where I'm like, I'm not used to being a tourist, you know. And so, you know, I, I really just feel like that, maybe like just overwhelm me you know so and, and people always talk about like yeah you, you know how's the japanese crowd i love the japanese crowd they're super quiet but you know what they don't really know is it was actually a party before the fight you know we're uh, like we're, when i usually get to to the arena it's about two or three hours before you know and i'm fighting you know i was i was at the arena for like eight nine hours just sitting around you know and anytime mm -hmm. i try to go to sleep you know get some rest somebody's waking me up you know so you know i was like toward that third round, I just wasn't as focused as I could have been. Um, so I feel like anything that could have went wrong, it just it just wasn't my night. Um, I learned from that and I moved forward. And June 14, I'm gonna take this guy out. All right, so let's talk about some of the other things. Uh, we saw what Sage North got. Now he was a striker, fought another striker, but it was in a ring, which has completely different spatial dynamics. One, it's everything's a right angle. So it's sharp corners. And two, the ropes are a little bit different. So how much of the right angles and the ropes were an issue when you fought Horiguchi the first time? Well, I just feel like, uh, you know, just the whole stop in the fight, in the middle of a fight, you know, when I got... Reset position. Yeah, reset position. I think that threw me off, you know. Uh, maybe put him in better position. But, you know, it, I, they did put me back in the position, and I lost it, you know. So it, it, was, it wasn't anything that the... Uh, I, I could have finished the fight and I should have finished the fight, so it was, it was my fault, you know. But um, definitely the ring played a factor, you know. I was exerting energy in, in places where I shouldn't have, where, you know, if it was in, in a cage, you know, I, 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 it's, it's, it's not foreign, it's, it's, it's not new. It's, it's, I know where I exert energy, where I, where I can position myself. And like when to advance on a position, absolutely. when to hold it. Absolutely. Right? You know, slipping through that, we were slipping through the cage. It was, it was chaos, you know. Yeah, that's a weird one. But you still, you were doing pretty good. So. You got uh, submitted in the third round, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. First two rounds were all yours, though. Yeah, no, nah, he he had some success on his feet. You know, uh, he 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 caught me off balance a few times. You know, um, again lack of focus probably. You know, but uh, yeah, I think uh, that third round, if you watch that fight, you know, I, I literally put him in position to submit me. I literally took him down. You know, rather than posturing up. I, I took my head, put it on his, like, here. I took his leg, put it here, you know, and pretty much... He just took what was there. Yeah, he just, I gave it to him, you know, and so uh, I'm not going to give him anything. He, he's not going to have any room to breathe. All right, so did you, have you gone back and watched the fight? Uh, yeah, I went back and watched the fight. Do you normally do that? Uh, I get a variety of answers when I talk to fighters uh, about that. Uh, well, it just depends, you know. This one, I, I needed to know, like, where I went wrong, you know, uh, what happened, you know, because I knew it wasn't the ability, I knew it wasn't, like, the actual fight, I, I I knew it was a mental lapse, and I wanted to know where it was that uh, I was, I took myself out of the game. Did you recognize yourself? You know what I mean? Like sometimes I'll watch, I'll talk to fighters, they'll watch tape, and they'll say, I don't even see my, like that's just another person in there. Like what, what did what did you see? Well, I think that 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 could be for all fights. You know, when when you under the, the big lights and, and you're fighting, you know, a, a different you is definitely in there, but. Uh, no, I, I don't feel like I was I was ex executing the way I, I, I wanted to. Um, I had a game plan, but you know, once I stepped in the cage, I I forgot about the game plan and I wasn't able to execute what I wanted. You know, and uh, it was definitely a difference, but um, you know, it happens. You know, so uh, that's why it's so many variables in a sport. You know, we learn and we grow. You know. Did you fly coach? Did I what? Did you fly coach? Fly coach. Like on the on the on the plane? Yeah, the plane? I, they had me in the middle seat. <laughs> they had me what? In, they had me in the middle seat. I was the champ in the middle seat, they man. Had me in the middle seat, bro. bro. How and long is that flight? Ten hours or something crazy. From the California. Yeah, from California. Still, that's pretty long. Yeah, no, nah, it, it was it was a grueling fl uh, flight. You know, it was overwhelming and. Um, but the 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 funny thing is, I'll do it all over again. What do you mean? Uh, I want to go back to Japan and, and you know. Oh, after, but you want a new experience. You we, we can do it all over again the same way, yeah. um, but the results are going to change. You know, the preparation is going to change, and uh, I know. Well, I have I had little to 
uh, no experience in, in a ring, you know, practicing, like, if leading up to that fight, I'd maybe jumped in the ring maybe one or two times, you know, and, and that was for pad work. It wasn't wrestling. It wasn't like, you know, just f familiar, familiarizing myself with positions I know inside the ring. You know, it was a lot of stand up, you know, thinking I was a boxer. Mayweather was on the car, you know, I'm thinking like, I mean, I'm gonna try to stand up with this guy. And you see a, a lot of stand up, but it just wasn't uh, an executed game plan or well executed game plan on my part. Did you get a chance to meet Mayweather? Uh, I seen him. Yeah. You know, I, 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 my, I want to fight him, you know? So um, I was in there, like, talking shit, like, you know, this guy's next, like, you know, because uh, you put those big gloves on, it's it, like, uh, it's not like MMA gloves, you know? Uh, yeah, it certainly you know? isn't. You, you, like, yeah, you, you, your heart gets bigger when, once uh, those bigger gloves. With them small gloves, you know, and I can, when I can grab people, it just makes everything easier, so. Uh, now, why didn't you train in the, uh, easier, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, but why not train in the ring, because, you know, did you just think it wouldn't be that different? Well, um, I don't know why I didn't. I, I, w I would like to, but... Uh, you had access to a ring, right? Yes. Right. Yeah, we got a ring in our in our gym, but uh, for one reason or another, we, we didn't we didn't go in there, you know? Hmm, so. That's interesting. Now, this time around, you don't have to worry about any of that. Back no. into the cage. Yes. How do you think he's going to fare? Because here's the thing. He has experience in the cage as well. This is a well-credentialed opponent, but nevertheless, this is your uh, home. Let's put, put it that way. Plus... Has he ever fought in a circular cage? Because the circular cage is different than the flat paneled cage as well. I think he hasn't. Yeah, he's familiar with the cage. He's had success in the cage. You know, he, he worked his way up to a, a world title uh, against Demetrius Johnson, you know. But uh, I just don't feel like he's going to be as comfortable as I'm going to be um, with, with the surroundings. Um, I feel like the cage is going to work to my benefit. Do you feel like you have something to prove? Uh, just to myself, you know. Because I know there's not a 135 pounder in the world that I can't beat, you know. And he's he's that guy, you know. He beat me, and it's my it's my turn. By the way, do you still rollerblade to this day? Never. Yeah, <laughs> just that one time. Never. I, I don't. No skateboards. Nothing like that. Just no no no, no rollerblades, no skates, no. You surf? No maybe. Wheels. Nah, I'm, I don't maybe mess California? with I don't mess with the sharks. Like I don't mess with the water. No, nothing. Yeah, I'll I'll go to the beach, but I ain't jumping in that water. Like that's not. All me. the jujitsu guys do that. Yeah, they. they well, they, all the Brazilians in here, they all surf. It's yeah, they, they they they. That's what. That's where they come from. They come from, you know, Brazil, where yeah. you know the sharks are on the shore. So, yeah. <laughs> like, to be being in the water in San Diego is they're cool with that. All right, fair enough. Uh, so let's talk about some of the fight pieces themselves. When you were locking up with him, even though everything had gone wrong, how did he feel physically? Oh, he's strong. Yeah, you know? he he's definitely stronger. One of the stronger guys I've ever fought. You know, um, he really. He, yeah, he he is though. He's he, like, and then the thing about uh, coming up from twenty five. You know, and we see it with Henry, and you know, we see it with you know these guys going up and weight. You got all the all your strength, you know, as got as opposed to guys that's cut weight. You know, so uh, it definitely plays a factor where he has all his strength, and you know, I still got my strength, but um, he's as strong as he's gonna be at 135. You know, as opposed to 125. You know, his mental game was uh, was surprising. I wasn't I wasn't uh, used to that. You know, I'm used to you know. Uh, second or third round breaking guys, you know, and, right. and looking across the cage and, and I see them, them worn out, you know, and so for uh, for him, uh, it wasn't the same. So uh, for me, uh, going into this, this this fight, it's not about breaking him mentally. I'm, I'm going to break his body. I'm going to shut his body off. Um, do you lift weights more now or when you were wrestling? Uh, I, when I was wrestling, for sure. What's the diff? Why? Um, I think that college... Uh, just like the whole college um, mentality, yeah, yeah, you know, they 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 eat weights up in college, and now you don't really need it. Uh, I just focus on like staying lean, you know, explosive. You still feel like you're strong? Oh yeah, I'm as strong as it. Like when you were locked up with other 135ers. Well, I actually uh, brought it. We brought in uh, some Arizona uh, wrestlers, and I was wrestling with a kid. Uh, he's 19. He's uh, and when I grabbed him, he had a different strength than anybody I was going with inside the the, the, the MMA gym. And I was like, man, like these wrestlers are really freaking strong. Like, <laughs> it was a difference for sure. Yeah, but still, you competitive. Like, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No. It, it, you find ways around it. You know, um, right. speed kills. So um, it certainly does. Let, let's talk about the 135ers in the UFC because what's interesting about this fight is um, number one, it's a rematch and it's interesting and and everything we've been talking about. But it's sort of like a world title to a degree, right? It's the best guy in Japan, Ryzen, more than Japan, but okay, that's where it's based, versus the best guy in Bellator. 
And then you saw what Henry did against Marlon. Did you expect Henry to do that? I expected it. Did you? I, I was caught by surprise. Tell me why you expected it. Well, he's just, he's a champion, you know? Uh, he's won on every level uh, of, of his combative career, you know? His, his, I mean, it, it, same as me, you know? It's, it's not like uh, guys are coming from uh, out of nowhere, you know? Um, and uh, just t winning world championships, you know? You, like, I'm sure guys like Adesanya, guys like Kamaru Usman, these guys have been doing this, you know, from, you know, grade school. And that's what Henry's been doing. He's been winning since grade school. And it's not going to change, you know. Um, but it's when you get guys that both guys have been winning since grade school. And, you know, that's where you, you know, you're going to, you're going to, that's what you're seeing now. You're seeing, um, I, and I don't, I don't know Marlon's background, but I know Henry's a champion. I know he, uh, he's, he's won on every level. Um, so I, I kind of knew he, after beating Dillashaw, like, uh, I, I thought Dillashaw was the best guy in the division outside of D Dominic Cruz, mm. um, and uh, Henry, he smoked him. yeah, he mm. just ran over him. So I kind of uh, thought, figured that. But um, I, I've always qu questioned Henry's mental toughness, um, and if he can um, tell folks why, because uh, I made the point here when he didn't make the 2012 uh, national team. You know, coming off the gold medal, you thought this guy was a lock to make the team. I don't think he made it past the semis, if not the quarters, but. Um, and then he, you know, he just kind of fell off. He retired. He had the whole falling out with Terry Brands. Yeah. There was a lot of people being like, I don't know if this guy's going to work. And he missed weight twice in Legacy, you know, yeah. but he eventually caught up. But why, why were you questioning? Well, that's, that, those are, all those those are yeah, all of those things, you know. Um, and when, when you're talking about quitting the sport, you know, you start, start to, uh, you know, we've we seen that with Rory McDonald. And, and you know, we've seen his last performance. He won the fight, you know, but that, that's not the best Rory McDonald we've seen, you know. And so whenever you start doubting yourself and you start doubting your abilities and if, what you're in the sport for, you know, you, that, that's all mental, you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for me, uh, just question his mental toughness. And he, he was able to, you know, pull out, like, go be down in the first this, this last fight and, 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 and win. Um, second round, I think. Third. Third round, yeah. you know. But that's a credit to, you know, um, just sticking with it and grinding, you know, and that's what wrestling, that's what wrestling, um, it brings out of you, you know, you, it, it gives you that never say die attitude and uh, it instills those values. In you. Daniel Cormier told me something once about wrestlers. It, it's not just that, like, you, I thought your earlier point was quite astute, which is like, oh, you got to get the guys who've been winning since the very beginning. He made a point. He goes, "What's like? What sets Ronda apart from these women? She's a better athlete, probably, but like, is that really what sets her apart? What sets her apart is that at she's been a lifelong athlete from day one when she was five. She was competing at whatever the highest level for five year olds is, and then seven, nine, eleven, fifteen, whatever, blah blah. And at every in an interval, she, she's been the highest level, and she's been doing it since you had any athletic skill at all. That's what Henry's been doing. That's what you've been doing." That to me is the difference. Marlon looks the part, like he is chiseled out of stone, and maybe he's been one. I don't know. I, I can't. I can't say with any degree of certainty. But that to me is the difference, right? That's yes. why Cormier succeeds. You succeed. Absolutely. That's the difference there. Absolutely. I, I, it's very rarely are you going to see a guy uh, in high school start their career wrestling and be a state champ by their senior year. You know, start start as a freshman and then senior year you you win you win in states. You know. Very rarely you see that, you know. You, you, especially in New Jersey. Especially in New Jersey, you know. And so it, it's countless hours because guys are, are really programmed to, to be a certain way and, and be a certain athlete. And, and um, years and years of, of experience of that, you know, is definitely going to be the, just an athletic and shit guy, you know. If you fought uh, Henry, what's the key to beating him? Uh, I just beat him. <laughs> Henry, <laughs> what does that mean? He ain't fucking with me, period. Well, what does that mean? It's just, it's just not. The same. He's a little guy, you know. Uh, me you and, are big for a bantamweight, yeah, I have to say. He's a little guy, like he's he's like Horiguchi, you know. Um, uh, Two thousand and what six? We were we were on Adapter Dan together, where it's uh, Team USA, which is the number one wrestler in the country, which we were uh, myself and Henry were, um, versus Team Pennsylvania, which is predominantly the best uh, wrestling state, you know, in the country, uh, and. I just, he was just so small, and I, I never looked at him as a threat, and I still don't look at Henry as a threat. He's just, uh, he's, a, he's a champion in a different di division, or a different organization than I, I'm at. And uh, once uh, the UFC, and, uh, which we probably know, we know it probably won't happen uh, so soon, but once the UFC uh, 
starts cross promoting and cross you know uh, agrees to fight their champs versus guy or champs like Bellator's champs and whatever other champs then um, you're the guy oh I'm the guy I'm uh, I'm I mean, it is what it is. Again, Henry's not a threat. Um, I would like to. I would like that fight, you know, just because um, I know it'll be, go my way, and and you, the UFC guys get more more pub, more everything, yeah. And so. Um, hey, you're here. I know. I know. <laughs> and and it's a pleasure to be here. Of course. Um, so, for me, uh, Henry's not not a threat. I I get my hands on that guy and. All right, very good. Um, so for this week, is there a plan in terms of what you want out of Saturday? Is it just a W, or is there some kind of like Darian Caldwell stamp you're trying to put on this guy? You know I gotta, I, mean? I gotta finish this guy. Yeah. If I don't finish this guy, I'm not happy. I'm never really happy with just a win. You know, to me, a win is is just a loss. Like, I gotta finish this guy. I'll only be happy if I finish him. It's pretty hard to finish though. Even Demetrius Johnson. Granted, it was a while ago and. A different weight class, but but he's finishable, yeah. He is, yeah. but who isn't? Truth. Who isn't? You nobody's know what I mean? nobody's susceptible to to losing. Is he getting, the best guy you fought? Um, Haraguchi. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, far and away, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. Because uh, the time and glow one that was the, he caught you early in your career. This yeah. one is still this is your more senior level at this point. Yeah, no, I'm definitely a vet in the sport, you know, and I think it's time that I start getting the credit that I deserve. I deserve. You don't think you, know? you do? No, I don't. I think uh, people overlook me, and uh, they overlook because I fight for Bellator, which isn't the UFC, because uh, whatever reason or not, you know, uh, I think I've always been overlooked, whether it's been wrestling, you know, where, where I go in there and beat, beat a Metcalf, pin up Metcalf, you know, uh, in 2000, 2008, and then 2009, I'm a big underdog. How, how did that happen? I just pinned the guy last year. You know, I, whatever it may be, like, it, I just don't get the credit I deserve, but I continue to win, so it doesn't really matter to me, you know? So is this fight with Horaguchi, is this best bantamweight on the planet in your mind? Absolutely. Yeah? You think Horaguchi's better than Henry Cejudo? Absolutely. Really? I do. Wow. That's bold. If you see Henry's style, he's, he mimics, you know, Horaguchi. He's like, he probably went back to the drawing board, like, who gave Demetrius Johnson their biggest fight, their hardest fight? You know, and it, before, uh, Henry, before Henry beat uh, Demetrius, Horaguchi was the best fight that Demetrius had, you know, he, he that's true, he, you know, and so I'm sure he, and Henry, before that, Henry didn't fight in that karate style, you know, so I'm sure he went back to the drawing board, used some of his, uh, some of his, his tactics, his techniques, and, you know, now you have a Henry Cejudo 2.0 who, who looks like a karate style wrestler. Karate style wrestlers, although he had to kind of box his way on this one. But, yeah, he, uh, yeah, for sure. But hey, let me ask you, the neck tattoos. Yeah. How painful is that? Actually, they, they weren't painful. I have a hard time believing that. Nah. <laughs> the painful tattoos were these right here. Like, yeah, I've got some rib tattoos as well. Yeah, they those, suck, were, yeah those were painful. These but, didn't you know, hurt? Nah, they got this uh, numbing cream where you put it on for an hour, and you take it off, and you let it sit for about 30 seconds, and you're good for four hours, and you don't feel a thing. Wow. So yeah, so if if you're if you're a tattoo artist ain't using a numbing cream, then bro, he's just he's just knuckling me into the dirt with that with that <laughs> needle gun. Good lord, I never even heard of that. I've got many tattoos, I never even heard of that. Thing. Yeah, no, nah, for sure, the numbing cream is is definitely it's, especially when you're going through eight hour sessions. You know, I went through like a, a eight hour session with you know my neck and then my, my watch, watch the microphone. My neck and then my stomach, you know. So, yeah. you know, um, definitely when you, when you uh, going through uh, that type of trauma, you wanna you wanna numb it up. Are you gonna do the John Wall bit where you just get covered head to toe? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm not finished. Yeah, no, I always no face tats though. That, but that's isn't that really millennial? It's like yeah. a real millennial. Yeah, no, nah, for that. sure, no face tats though. No Takashi six nine. The, bit? the closest to my face is maybe here, uh, but let me see. You know, behind behind, oh, behind uh, the ear, yeah. yeah, behind the ears, right behind the uh, the, the, the beard line. line. Yeah, the yeah. beard line, but. Uh, the face tattoos, uh, I think they're overrated. Yeah, I've noticed like all these millennial rappers, I don't know what you call Post Malone, whatever he is, they all got the face work done. Yeah. That all seemed like a bridge too far to me. Yeah, nah, I still, uh, I still, I'm already intimidated. I don't need to be like that intimidated. <laughs> Fair enough. I got to tell you, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to your fight, man. Thank you. It is going to be it. It's, uh, oh, real quickly, before I let you go, uh, Son and Machida, who do you like? 
Pick a I side. Like, I like Chael Sonnen. You know what? I like him on this one, too. Yes. Got to be honest. I like it. Um, Rory versus Neiman Gracie. That's very, very one. dicey. Yes. That's dicey. And now, you, you asked me that question two years ago with Neiman Gracie as good as he is today. And, 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 and Rory as mentally focused as he was two years ago. And I'd say Rory, you know. But... Nowadays, it's a toss-up because we don't know. We, we don't know what kind of Rory is going to come out. So, and I did, I'll be honest. I hadn't even in here in studio. I told him I, I didn't see him beating Ed Ruth, but he did. Yeah, but he did. Yeah, you know, incredible. And that's, that's a cool thing about our sport. It's so many variables, to, so many ways to win. You know, um, you just got to pick what works for you. Well, I, I am. Uh, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled you came in here. Cannot wait to see this fight. I've been telling everyone this is the best fight this weekend. It's the two best fighters. It's the only fight that matters. Yeah? It's, it's incredible. Um, so I, I, I normally say uh, don't wish anyone good luck. I won't do that. But I will say thank you for coming in here. Our friends will guide you out. And uh, I look forward to seeing your fight, man. Thanks for having me. There you go. Nice meeting you. Appreciate the effort. Yes, sir. There we go. Darian Caldwell, everybody. With many, many tattoos. Uh, all right. We are trying to get hold of Mr. Sterling. Do we want to... Um, do we want to do some tweets? What do you want to do, Danny Segura in the back? Yeah, sure. People calling my phone in the whole time. Uh, all right. I am very excited about that. We're going to get Mr. Caldwell or um, the Caldwell versus Horiguchi. That is, uh, if you guys haven't paid attention, those are two of the best fighters in the world. And they're going to be fighting in a rematch from a Ryzen bout. This is, this is uh, well, it's everything. I mean, a legitimate claim to being one of the best bantamweights in the world, if not the best, depending on one's perspective. You got Horiguchi, top of his game, Caldwell, top of his game, change in venue, both in terms of the country, both in terms of the fighting surface. It's the real deal, man. The bantamweight division is hot. Here's how you know a division is hot. It's not just hot in one organization. It's when you look globally and you're like, damn, there are murderers everywhere. And Bellator's got a hot bantamweight division and then you just look around the rest of the world. There's just bantamweights coming out of the woodwork, killing people. It's the same as the lightweight division. Look around the world. Where, where, where what, what is one reliable division for virtually every organization? Lightweight. Because they're just murderers up and down that thing. And that's true no matter where you go. Bantamweight is getting to that level. It's pretty close. All right. Speaking of bantamweights, let's go to another one now. He had a phenomenal win over the weekend beating Pedro Munoz. And, um, well, I think he's your top contender. He joins us now on Skype. The one and only Funk Master is here, Al Jermaine Sterling. Al Jermaine, how are you feeling, sir? I'm feeling good. feeling great, man. I feel like I'm on top of the world. <laughs> <Ready to conquer. laughs> uh, let me see your hand. Is that a cast? Yeah, it's a little bootleg cast, something they made at the hospital for me. I guess I, like, tore the ligament on my <laughs> I don't know. So I might have to have like a small surgery, with like a little pin. So it takes like four weeks to heal up. So I don't know. Okay. So if they had to do some kind of title fight soon, I, don't, I mean, um, Henry seems super beat up. So I don't think that they would. But I guess what you're saying is you're not going to be out for long if needed. Yeah. It's, uh, they said it's a small procedure. They said um, it's probably better if I get it just so that I can have the full mobility of my thumb. I mean, after the fight, I didn't really notice it until the adrenaline came down. I was like, it's starting to bother me, but I don't know. They, they said this was more more important than the uh, the, than the leg. Uh, okay, so let's talk about your performance. Boy, that that's not your best performance ever. It's pretty close. You got to be feeling great about that. Give me a grade. <laughs> How do you grade yourself? I think I get an A+. Plus. I mean... There were some things I felt I could have done a little bit better. Of course, there's always going to be takeaways like that. Uh, there, there's some opportunities that I thought I was going to be able to capitalize on a little bit more. But Pedro's a tough dude, man. He was able to adjust on the fly also. I think I pitched a shutout in that first round. And then the second round, he made some adjustments. And then I had to make some adjustments within that second round to, to steal back that round. Because I know he was kind of picking up a little bit of momentum in there. And uh, there was that one body kick he caught me with and I was like ah oh. and I, I acknowledged it I let him know it hurt I was like yeah he got me you know I was okay with letting him know I'm like I'm, but you're not gonna get me out of there like you did Caraway I'm not gonna curl up in a little fetal position in like a little ball you know so uh, it was a great performance man I definitely think I, I show people that I can truly do it all now the uh two questions one was the kick one of those teeps straight up the middle 
It was well, not a teep. It was a push kick. He, push he kick, threw yeah. the, the rear leg kick. Yeah, the rear leg kick. It came up the middle, um, and I think he he threw it while I was coming in to throw a, a jab from the southwest, a jab from the southwest side, or a cross from the southwest side. And uh, it just the way, just the way I think I was circling out and throwing the punch. It, it just got right underneath and just hit me right in the money spot, and uh, mm. it hurt. But uh, good thing we were able to recover quickly. Yeah, I did. I did my crunches. Uh, now <laughs> what, you mentioned you had to make some adjustments in the second round. What, what were those adjustments, or what was one of them? What was what was key that had to be different for for you to stay ahead? It was where my my elbow placements were, and uh, and my stance. You know, I was kind of going a little loose with my hands, and I I tend to keep my hands low just so I can flow a little bit better. My punches seem to come a little faster when I throw when I keep my hands at a more of what people would consider unconventional stance, but it works for me. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it teaching it to like newcomers or whatnot, but uh, I was able to keep my elbows in a little bit tighter, which allowed me to check the kicks faster. I think there's one of the kicks in the second round he threw and I cracked him back with a, with a cross or a one, two. And uh, I felt that's when the momentum started to shift back into my, my favor. And I, I think he started to realize he he had to really set those up and stop just spamming them because he was just spamming them at a point, just trying to touch, just trying to touch, just trying to touch. Mm. And uh, I had to just tighten up my defense the right way. And uh, once we, and I was just worried about the head kick, so I didn't want to keep my hands too low, thing and body, and then it comes over the top with the with the with the head kick. So I did good, just keeping the elbows right at home and protecting the ribs, and then coming back up to be able to re- return like right after he uh, he do his strikes. Were you surprised at his chin at all? The old boy can take a shot, can he? Oh my God! I didn't know what else I had to hit the guy with. I was, I was, I was calling to man. I was like, "Hey, can I get a, can I get a brick? Because this guy's not going down." Uh, pretty amazing. All right, let me uh, tell yeah, you, man, he's a tough dude. Let me tell you something that happened to me yesterday. There's, what I'm about to tell you is 100 percent true, Aljamain. I am not in any way exaggerating. One of one of the most decorated coaches in MMA texted me yesterday. Wow, where are you headed? Where are you headed? Illuminati's. Uh, Illuminati's. Some deep dish pizza. Yeah. Illuminati's. Oh, you're still in Chicago. Yeah, yeah, still still out in Chi Town. Uh, all right. Well, look, I'll make this uh, relatively quick. I had a uh, one of the most uh, decorated coaches in MMA reach out to me and say for very technical reasons that they believe you're the toughest matchup for Henry Cejudo. When you hear something like that, how does that make you feel? Yeah, it makes me feel good, man. I, I definitely do think so. I think I possess all the talent in the world to compete with Henry. Henry's a tough dude, man. And, and I think he is the pound for pound greatest combat athlete out there today. I mean, no one's done what that guy has done and been able to accomplish. But I will say this, when I beat him, when I beat Henry say doo what does that make me? The pound for pound king. So that's what I'm looking to do. that's what I'm looking to get my, my next title. So go out there, beat up Henry, and uh I think I'm gonna be able to take that title. I think I I'm too long, too rangy, I can box, I can kick, I can wrestle, I can do jujitsu. Where does he win? He's gotta try to catch me. So I, I like my chances in that one. All right, but he called out everybody but you. What do you make about that? <laughs> uh because he wants to be the legend killer. The legend killer. Oh, my goodness. You want to fight guys who haven't won a fight in God knows how long? I, I don't know if he's scared or I don't. I can't call him scared. You know, he's fought some of the baddest men in our weight classes in, in history. But to be calling out guys who haven't won a fight in three years, guys who are coming out of retirement, who are 40, when you got young, hungry competitors that are well-deserving of a, of a shot, I, I think there's something wrong with that. Um, wh- why is it you believe you have the skills? Like, what is it about what you offer that no one else offers? Because there's lots of people who are very, very tough competitors, but it's got to be more than that. It's the funk, baby. I bring the funk. It's a different. It is a different style. Sometimes I, people ask me, like, I like even when I teach my MMA classes at the gym, I. I it's hard for me to teach what I do. It's, it's just very different. It's more of a. Uh, a state of flow, a state of just feel. You don't just, you can't, like, it's not a robotic thing where it's like one, two, three, kick, one, two, three, switch, switch, jab, cross. It's not like that. It's it's completely unorthodox and everything's about rhythm, tempo, 
and pace, and it's it's a different style, man. And when you factor in the wrestling, the scrambles, the jiu-jitsus, I, I just think uh, I'm a tough matchup for anybody in this division. Like I said before, Marlon got lucky. He got lucky. I won't make that mistake again. In terms of what Henry's going to do, he's, the UFC is going to let him remain the flyweight champ. So do you think he's going to fight Bantamweight next, or he's going to go back down to 125? And I guess the question is, are you prepared to wait if you have to? Uh, that's a tough question. That is a tough question. I never thought about that. Yeah. I, I just For some reason, I always felt he was just going to have to defend at 35 because he won't have to cut as much weight. Um. Right now, I don't think there's a number one, a clear number one contender at 25. I don't think so. Maybe Joseph Benavidez, but I know they fought already. He has a win over Henry, so that could possibly happen. Or Forminga. Oh, they, those guys are fighting each other, though, right? Yeah, end of the month. Yeah. For, okay. Yeah. So, pending the results of that, I guess it's going to be decided on what's the more intriguing matchup. And hopefully it's me. I think uh, hopefully they have a boring fight. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I'm hoping for. Jake's not going wood. I'm hoping that uh, I did enough to, to impress the, uh, the UFC brass. Yeah, well, I guess we'll have to see how it goes. One more for you, and I'll let you go get that pizza. Um, I guess the thing I'm thinking about here is your striking style. You came from wrestling. You came from grappling. It's been an ace in the hole for a long time. But this one was almost 100% on the feet. And you've got a really unique style. I'm wondering, like... Um, how you must feel in nurturing that part of your game to the point where you were able to establish a number one contendership on the back of that, and there's no one else that really strikes like you except kind of a little bit, John Jones. Yeah, you know, it's funny. People were starting to bring back those comparisons all over again, and it kind of reminded me of the beginning of my career. And at the beginning of my career, I was very wild style, very uneducated in what I was doing. I was just doing stuff I saw on YouTube, doing stuff I saw John Jones, Anderson Silva do, and uh, it worked. Dominic Cruz, I copied a lot of stuff from those guys, and then as I got older, I started changing my style to more wrestling and kicking, and then I kind of switched, and now I'm kind of back to striking, but actually I know what I'm doing now. If that makes sense. It's, it's such a weird evolution, the way I've been able to see myself develop, just watching the beginning of my UFC career to where I am now, it's it's a it's a problem, man. I think it's a problem for anybody. And like I said, sometimes I don't even know what I'm what I'm looking for. It's just whatever is the opening presents itself, I, I go for it. And I'm starting to see these openings and it's starting to feel like wrestling. And I think uh, with anything, man, you gotta you gotta crawl before you can run, you know. And I took my baby steps, I took my lumps on the way up, and here I am, man. Ah, June eighth. June 8th was a great day. It was a great it night. It certainly was. <laughs> All right, what's going to go on the pizza? Tell us. Uh, hopefully extra cheese, maybe some chicken, maybe some macaroni. On the, if they have some mac, I don't know. We're going to see what they recommend. I, I've never done a Chicago style before, so. Well, I've got terrible uh, news for you. it's going to be a good one. It, it, it's actually delicious, but it's just not pizza. It's nothing like New York. Don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. <laughs> that's what everyone's telling me so i don't know i'm gonna i heard there's a lot of dough so yeah just gonna give it a shot you know when in rome do what the romans do i hear you go get that pizza hey thank you so much for your time al Jermaine. congratulations on the win thanks for having me there make sure you, you guys tune in tune in for the next show we will thank you al Jermaine. appreciate it there he is all right getting that pie Listen, Chicago's a great town, maybe one of America's most underrated towns. It's a phenomenal place. Your pizza is basura. I mean, it tastes fine, but it's not, you know, you need a forklift to grab a slice. No, thank you. I'll stick to the Manhattan pizza 10 times out of 10. All right, let's do this now with the time we have remaining. It is time, I believe, for a round of tweets. Let's do that, shall we? Five minutes on the clock. Here we go. Wait, wait, wait. I'm not going to start until you get the clock. There we go. Hold on. Got to get that. Got to get that timer up. Bop, bada, bop, bop. There it is. There's the timer. And there we go. Okay. Who do you see as the biggest threat to Valentina Shevchenko if there ever was one? Influenza is the biggest threat to Valentina Shevchenko. Short of that, not a soul. Next. Uh, Luke, there's any particular reason why Eric Albaracin's fighters are having so much success lately? You know, I asked him to come on today's show, and he wasn't available, at least not to me. 
So I need to dig into the details on that one a little bit more. Obviously, he has a background uh, at the senior level in wrestling himself uh, through the Army. So he knows what takes what it takes to compete. But beyond that, I'm not really sure. I need to, I need to dig into the details more. Next. Uh, thoughts on Azard signing the soccer hour? <laughs> yeah, like I said, first of all, it's fine. The Jokic signing, then the Azard signing. Madrid's going to come back. They're going to sell bail for a million dollars or whatever. A gazillion dollars, and I hope they, they're not going to get Mbappe probably, but there's some other names they could get in the uh, offseason. And when they do, I'm going to be even more insufferable, you peasants. All right, next. Uh, is Cejudo actually a better 135er than a 125er? Similar to how DC is a better heavyweight than a light heavyweight. Don't, that's a great question from our own Casey Lydon. Don't know the answer. Uh, need to see him compete at 135 a couple of more times because. The distance issues in this fight, he was able to overcome them by somebody who was relying on another person to allow distance versus, as I mentioned before, Max Holloway fights a distance because he forces it. I need to see how he handles somebody who is better at forcing distance. So the answer could be yes. DC, we know because he started heavyweight, then went to light heavyweight, then went back to heavyweight. Um, I just need a bigger body of work to make a more informed judgment. But would I be surprised if he's better at 135? Not necessarily. No. Next. Is Tony Ferguson the greatest face rearranger in MMA? He certainly leaves a mark on his opponent's faces. There was actually a, a post. You go and look at the opponent's faces. So whether it was Anthony Pettis or Kevin Lee or Edson Barboza or Donald Cowboy Cerrone, or, you know, on and on, Lando Venata, their faces were all super jacked up, uh, RDA, because he just puts a beating on these guys. It's not, you know, Jessica I's face was probably fine because she took a shin to the dome. Um, but Ferguson just kind of really, you know, he just grinds the meat. The original face rearranger was BJ Penn. BJ Penn was the guy who was out there changing faces when it was, you know, Cal Uno and... Um, God, who are some other ones? He just just utterly annihilated. DJ or uh, Diego Sanchez was one. Kenny Florian less so, but he beat him up too. But yeah, there was just a bunch of guys. Here. Joe Stevenson, when there was like a geyser out of his forehead from the rear naked choke and after, after the elbow. Yeah, but Tony Ferguson has inherited that mantle. Next, uh, Valentina Shevchenko's confidence is through the roof right now, and she is the only woman that has given Amanda Nunes trouble. Could you see them fighting again at 135? Absolutely. The 2021 Abu, da Abu Dhabi card, possibly? Well, I don't want to look that far into the future, but do I think that Shevchenko and Nunes have fought for the last time? Only if Nunes retires early. If she sticks around long enough, there's not a doubt in my mind they're going to fight a third time. Absolutely. Next. How long will uh, Valentina own 125 pounds? Again, unless somebody comes along, like maybe let's see what happens with Macy Barber. She's got two, three years to figure it out. Let's see. But if someone doesn't come along just looking at the current crop, the answer is as long as she wants. Uh, short of making a huge mental error, injury, or influenza. That is it. Next. Uh, how are your sinuses working now after the surgery? Are you still mouth breathing? Would you recommend the surgery to a fellow perpetually clogged nose mouth breather like myself? I feel like it made a slight improvement. I won't say it made a dramatic improvement. I still have a lot of problems with my nose. That I guess are just not fixed. I had a sinus plasty for folks who may not know what that is. Um, and here's what I would tell you that the recovery is awful. It is awful. And that I got it during the birth of my daughter, well, two days after, was very stupid. I do not recommend that <laughs> to anybody. Uh, look, it's made some improvements, but it's, I think I just got so much damage back there without significant intervention. It's just going to be what it's going to be. Next. Uh, which is more likely, a rematch of Tony and Cowboy or Tony getting winner of Habib and Poirier fight? Uh, again, assuming Connor doesn't intervene, Tony and Cowboy rematch, which, by the way, is also not going to happen. One more of these. By the way, that, just, just so it's clear, that's why they want to do Tony and Cowboy rematch. Not because there's like an unresolved question. Slightly there is, just so Connor can get leeway to fight the winner of Habib and Poirier. It's got nothing else to do with anything. One more, one more, one more, one more! All right. Should the UFC simply give Valentina a belt every three or four months in order to save a couple of handfuls or so lives? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here I am saying all this, and now, you know, she may go in there and lose against Chukagan. I don't see that happening. Chukagan's a fine fighter. She's a good fighter. She's a nice person. Um, I, you know, you're just dealing with somebody who is utterly beyond that. 
Um, so, like I said, what do you do when the most qualified contender for a fight is so far behind that it's a mismatch? I don't know if mismatches in like one's better. A mismatch is that when one is so much better, it ends up resulting in a horrible consequence for the loser. That's what you saw here. Like they just get thoroughly thrashed. Uh, all right. Big thanks to, let's see. By the way, I don't want to forget this. Bellator NYC this weekend, uh, Friday, I believe. Can't wait for that. Big thanks to Darren Caldwell for coming in here. Congrats to Aljamain Sterling. Hell of a win. Over the weekend. Thank you guys. Keep sending those tweets using the hashtag the MMA Hour. Keep calling 844 866 2468. International callers, the MMA Hour at voxmedia.com. And until next time, stay frosty, donks. <laughs>